It's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to uh, be, be here and make this announcement in front of all of you. Um, I don't really get this large of a crowd, and when I do, they're all quite a bit older than you normally. Uh, so it's really nice to have your uh, creativity and energy here. Thanks for that. Um, we have a very strong relationship with Purdue, Cummins does, and it goes back some time. Uh, it turns out that we not only, that I not only have worked with with the gov governor and, and, and that relationship, but at all levels of our company. Uh, we work with uh, the diff different departments, especially mechanical engineering, um, more and more with uh, other departments of Purdue. We do research together, we fund a professorship, and it just turns out that we hire more of you, more engineers from Purdue than any other company, any other uh, institution in the world. So you are our biggest source of talent. And it turns out, of course, for a company like ours, uh, t t recruiting the best talent, putting the best talent in the field is the single most important thing we can do to win. So you guys are a big, big part of how we, how we do that. So thanks very much again for letting me be here. Um, let's uh, carry on. Um, I wanted to say today that um, you know, I want to cover with you a couple of really important things just to level set everyone so we know where we are. I'll do a, a brief introduction. Uh oh, we're running away from me. There we are. Uh, a brief introduction. Of myself, um, I'll talk a little bit about Cummins. Many of you may know Cummins, but I'm guessing not everybody, but he does. It's a fabulous company, but we're, we're, not everybody knows this yet. So I'll do very brief on that, and then I want to come to the primary purpose of my discussion, which is talking about what, uh, what what we're trying to do with environmental sustainability and what we're trying to do today. So I'll do that, and you know the the, the announcement today is a big deal, not because it's the first one we've ever made on work we're doing environmental sustainability. We've had a long history, and I'll talk about that, but because we are raising the bar and trying to do more and new and different things. And so I just thought that would be a good time to share that with you. And then I'll do Q&A, which is my favorite part of all these conversations. So hopefully you guys will be energized by that time to come up with some good questions. All right, let's go to the next one. So uh, just a couple minutes about me. So I've been with the company. Um, as Governor Daniel said, I've been here for more than 20 years. I'm going to stop counting at 20, and from now on, it's just going to say more than 20. Um, but it has been a while. Um, I've, been, I've been, had most of my career here. I did have a little bit of background in some other things. I graduated as a mechanical engineer uh, from Stanford. I also did some work in economics, um, and I did my MBA from Stanford. So I have kind of a business and, and engineering background. I worked for a financial company for a few years, including some time in Asia. But when I joined Cummins, I realized this is the place I wanted to be. And the reason it was the place I wanted to be is I kept getting challenging assignments in all the different parts of the company. So I worked in manufacturing. I worked in engineering. I got a chance to work in finance. I actually was a CFO for a short while. I was in purchasing, which is the, maybe the place I thought I was least likely to go. And I ended up loving that job. Um, and of course, I've done uh, general management jobs in different parts of the company. I've worked lived and worked in different parts of Cummins over all those time. And each time I got the job, I was more challenged than the last time. And the last few jobs were the kind that when you get there, you suck it and think, am I really going to be able to do this? And if you haven't had a job like that, you really haven't had a great job yet. That, those are fun. So all that has kind of made me think, this is the place I want to stay. So I've been here a lot longer than I maybe thought I would be when I started. I was attracted to Cummins, though, because I wanted to join a company that stood for more than just making money. And maybe that sounds a little corny, but it, you know, I was young once too, and it mattered to me to be that, that the place that I worked had a positive impact on the world beyond earning some money for its shareholders. And when I was um, uh, at business school at Stanford, I was looking around for manufacturing companies to join, and I was in the Career Center. I don't know if you've ever visited there, but uh, I tried to visit there as little as I could. But I, had to, I was forced to go there when it was time to get a job. So I went up in there and said, where, where, where do I want to work? And I was looking through brochures and other pieces of, of paraphernalia from different companies. And I found this quote from a former leader and kind of the protagonist of Cummins over many years, a man named Erwin Miller. And I'll just take a brief moment, if you're OK. I want to read you a quote, the quote that I read that brought me to Cummins. Let me see if I can find it here quickly. Um, here it is. In the search for character and commitment, we must rid ourselves of inherited and even cherished bias and prejudices. Character, ability, and intelligence are not concentrated in one sex over the other, nor in persons of certain accents, or in certain races, or in persons holding degrees from some universities over others, except Purdue. <laughs> 
when we indulge ourselves in such irrational prejudices, we damage ourselves most of all and ultimately assure ourselves of failure and competition with those more open and less biased. So that sounds more like a civil rights leader or a poet or something else. And this was the man who was the chief executive of Cummins for 25 or more years. And the way that he set about the company was to say, we want to lead a company where leadership means more than earning profits or reducing inventory, though it does mean that. It means being absolutely excellent at your business, world class at your business, but also thinking of leadership as being broader, things you do in the community, things you do to promote people and, and make them re help them reach their potential, to think about change and diversity and all those other things that are meaningful in our, in our society. And that felt like the institution that I wanted to work for, and that's what brought me here. And I think it comes, stems really from my own personal values. So from, my, from how I grew up as a, as a young child all the way through my, my working experience, I've developed these values and they become a lot about how I lead and who I am and how I want to spend the many hours I, I spend at, at work. And they tie back to these three things, which is that I think um, that fairness and justice are important things to strive for in the world, that it ought to be that everybody can reach their potential, that we all come with skills and capabilities and dreams and we ought to do, be able to give our best to reach them and it shouldn't be, the odds ought not be stacked against us. And of course they aren't, it isn't perfectly fair and just everywhere. But every place that, that we have the opportunity as a leader to make it better, more fair and more just, we ought to. It becomes our duty. So that's kind of how I think of my duty here. I, I can't fix everything, but if I have opportunity to make things better, I ought to. Second part is that I think of my um, work life and my family life as equal and important. So I think one feeds the other. So I have a very rich family life. I have uh, a wife and two daughters. One of them is at USC. Sorry about that. Um, I actually had to go to a football game and root for USC, which was very painful with my daughter. And my second one is just uh, signed up to go to Boston College. If those seem really far apart, it's, that was on purpose. I'm sure the younger one wanted to be nowhere near the older one. <laughs> so I have to fly apart. But two, so two daughters uh, now of college age. And you know, my, my relationship with them is one of the most important things in my life. And frankly, because I have such a good relationship with them, it makes it a lot easier to get up and go to the morning and work at, at work. And lastly, you know, I, I do work hard. I do think it's important to, 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 to give my all to things that I do. And I think that's what gives me my own feeling of self-worth and makes me less worried about how others view me and more worried and, and able to just be confident in what I do. I feel like I do it for the right reason and, and all that kind of thing, but working hard matters to me. So those are kind of my values. Those seem to align really strongly with Erwin uh, Miller's and a lot of other people at Cummins. So that's why I'm still there after all that time. It's not, not just because of pay and promotion. It's because of these things. All right, let's go to the next one. So Cummins. Um, as uh, Governor Daniel was saying, we've been around a while. In 1919, we started. The way we started is Rudolf Diesel had invented this new engine, uh, you, you know, a, a different kind of combustion process in Germany. And he, and he worked for a company called MAN at that time, and they licensed this technology to companies outside Germany who wanted to use it. And more than 100 companies in the U.S. licensed this technology to build the diesel engine, this brand new funky diesel engine. 1919. So we were an entrepreneurial company. We were a startup in 1919 with a technology license that more than, other, more than 100 other companies had. They had exactly the same designs that we had. And somehow, since 1919, over those years, Cummins is kind of the one survivor as an independent diesel engine maker in the US with that technology. And we were, of course, at that time, small company based in Columbus, Indiana. So you might wonder, how did a small company in Columbus, Indiana, be the one survivor in that. And we'll talk more about that. We have four business units now, though. So we don't only make engines. We do make a lot of engines. But we also make power generation systems. <coughs> and power generation systems, think of electricity generators based on reciprocating engines. We also make components, which are the technologies inside the diesel engine and natural gas engines that make it do what it does. So we don't make all the components, but we make the ones that, make the, that are key for performance, for emissions and for fuel economy. And lastly, we have a distribution and service arm which is all over the world. We're, in fact, we're in more than 190 countries around the world. And I travel to a lot of them. Uh, they're, they're, they, we are really in a lot of places. I can just tell you from my travel schedule, I have the thickest 
passport of any I've ever seen uh, from going to all these places. And we serve customers in critical needs, critical economic needs, trucking, um, mining, uh, <coughs> construction, all the things that really you know, create infrastructure for the world. In fact, you, if you have the good fortune of driving up and down 65, the reason you can't pass on the left that truck there, it's probably driven by a Cummins engine. Right? <laughs> Maybe more interesting to you, I re recently uh, have a plan, I, I, in the future I have a plan to visit a Heineken brewery where they have one of our generator sets that not only generates electricity, but they use the waste heat to, to do the brewing. And, and so we, it's a combined heat and power system for Heineken Brewery. And that will be one of my more exciting visits. Um, so those are the kind of things we do. About $17 billion in sales, so quite a big company. And you know, not only do we, are we in 190 countries, but we have 48,000 employees. So when I said to you that how we hire, retain, and deploy talent is critical, it's not just a few, right? It's trying to get all of us, all 48,000 of us, working together, doing really complicated things, and serving the customer. That's really the, the leadership challenge that exists at, at Cummins today. So let's go to the next one. I would say, because we're in so many countries, and we are so diverse as an organization, we do almost everything you can imagine. Not only do we make products, but we advertise, we sell, we buy, you know, we distribute, we do everything, right? But what, and we do it in so many countries and so many languages. The question is, what unites us? And there's a few things we make sure we say, these are going to be for all of us. We have a vision for the company and a mission statement. But what unites us most of all is the values that say, how do we want to do things? So we might be doing different things. One might be engineering, another might be uh, doing legal work, but we're going to use the same values for our how, how we do things. And these are those values. And this goes all the way back to Erwin Miller. So these values, while they might be stated differently today, they're not as poetic. None of us are quite have the turn of phrase that Erwin Miller had. But they are basically the values that he put in the company all the way back when he ran it. And they start with integrity. We're going to do what we said we were going to do, and we're going to do what's right. That's a high, high standard, it turns out. And the way Mr. Miller used to say it is, if whatever you did yesterday, you don't want to be in the front page of the paper and associated with you, don't do it. Which I thought was a pretty easy way to think about things. We also have one on innovation. So you'll see that throughout our company, delivering superior results. I said one of, his, one of the requirements is, is that you will do really well in earning money, and you will get your inventory levels down. He does think, he, he did think even back then, we have to be excellent, and we definitely think that now. So we have to have great financial results. And we think about our communities as one of our stakeholders. So corporate responsibility, making sure that every community that we're in is more successful because we're there. And not just more successful, meaning we, we're richer. And the community needs to be richer. They should be getting stronger because we're there. We should be a positive force in the community in every sense of that word. Diversity, so we think, as Mr. Miller said, that you know, if you're if you're the most the least biased, the most likely to find talent wherever it exists, you win. Purely a business view of the world of diversity. It also happens to be a much nicer idea in terms of how you live your life too. But it's also a great business strategy. And global involvement, which is think of the world without borders. So we act like there are no <coughs> borders when we think about our business around the world. So those are our values. They unite the whole company. Environmental sustainability, though, has become a business mission of the company, and that's, which is why we're going to announce these new standards and why we're pushing these things so hard. So late in the 90s, uh, we started competing in the US uh, a little differently. We were already competing to have the very best technology and engines, especially for tr trucking, because trucking was, a, was quite a big industry in the 70s and 80s. But then air emission standards started to be introduced in the US. And these new air emission standards wanted to reduce the emissions of diesel engines and trucking. And they were quite difficult standards. And we really didn't know how to meet them technically. And the, 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 the challenge was our customers were going to have to pay more for engines. And, and they weren't going to be able to charge their customers more. So you hear this a lot today, right? This, but for our industry, this was brand new in the 90s. And so Cummins, along with a lot of other companies, were trying to figure out how to reduce the impact on customers. And frankly, we saw the legislation as a burden, because we didn't know how to do it. 
without increasing cost to our customers, and our customers really just didn't want, didn't want any of this stuff. They didn't want any emissions control uh, equipment. So Cummins was kind of reluctantly moving in to this new technology. But then we realized that the opportunity for Cummins was to take the values we thought about the community and the technology that we had and say, no, let's, let's lead in this. Let's not be a reluctant participant. Let's be somebody who says, we're going to be the very best at emissions regulations technology. And we'll push the standards. We'll go faster than everybody <coughs> else. And so we turned what looked like a bit of a challenge and a burden into what we think is an opportunity. And we, by doing that, we said environmental sustainability has now become, become part of the mission of our business. And so that's what we started doing. We, and it fits with this idea of saying everything we do Leads, needs to lead to a cleaner, healthier, and safer environment. So this mission statement, which is, and again, remember, it, it says that we demand it. So now everybody who thinks about product design in our company, everybody who thinks about safety in our plants and around our facilities has to say, we have to be demanding what we do leads to a better environment. So it puts a burden on people when they do their work to be thinking about environmental sustainability in this way pushing ahead, looking for new innovations. So again, it's now becoming this sort of DNA of the company. After now more than 15 years of doing this, this is kind of how we think about what we do. So for example, we've now, we're now spending more than $500 million a year in R&D thinking about how to have more fuel efficient and better emissions engines and power generators. So a lot of R&D now is spent on just that. Secondly. You know, we're thinking about how we provide economic value and fuel savings to our customers even after they've bought them, going out in the field. I'll talk more about that. Dedicating a whole business unit just to emissions control technology. So the, this idea of this new division for after treatment and emissions control technology started in the year 2000. We had zero dollars of sales. <laughs> Said, let's, how, how can we begin to, to turn this into a business, not just a technology? It's now a, a division that has more than a billion dollars in sales. Very profitable division. So we've got, and we've also got lower operating costs through remanufacturing. So now we take back our engines, figure out how to uh, Im improve them or, or to <coughs> fix, fix what was old or broken or worn out, and then sell it back in there as a remanufactured engine. And this idea of salvaging tech, salvage technology is now a big technology development for Area for Cummins. How can we take a product that we, we used to throw away and put it back in the market and make it work just as well as a new one. Big off opportunity and, and we're doing a lot of work in that. Collaborate with government. So not only do we meet the standards, we collaborate with regulators to make the standards more difficult. Practical though, achievable, implementable, so, er you know, so it still works well economically in the industry but pushes the standards so we get, we get not only good products but we also get better air quality or better fuel economy. And lastly, we work in our communities every day to say, how can we help the community achieve some of its environmental sustainability goals? I'll talk more about that too. So, and all this goes on globally. So if, you don't have it, if we don't have it in our mission statement, if we don't have it in the way we talk about things every day, we'll do it in one place, but we won't do it with 48,000 employees all over the world. It's hard to reach those people. So it has to be part of what we talk about all the time. And that's how we're doing it globally. OK, so let's, let's talk about some examples. So since 2000, uh, these are just some of the things we've been doing on environmental sustainability. The reason I put this up is not to brag on it, but just to say we've been at this a while. So today's announcement is a big milestone for us, but we've been doing it for a while. And just to give you a couple of ideas, so all the way back in 2000, after we created the, new, the, the mission statement, we started working on product development of products that will, that will lead in emissions technology. And the stuff that we did in the late 90s and early 2000s still forms the basis for the engine technologies that we're releasing today. So by thinking ahead back then, we influenced engines that we're releasing all the way you know, 15 years later. Because the architecture, the technology we're developing is just playing out now. In the middle of the decade, we launched this really neat program called the Environmental Challenge. We said to ourselves, if environmental sustainability is going to be part of our business mission, we need to get more employees in this thing, not just development engineers. Who, what does everybody else do? 
We had this big corporate responsibility effort. We have community teams all over the world. So we said, let's do a contest. Every, every volunteer organization, all of our uh, community involvement teams can submit projects that help environmental sustainability in their community. And if they win, we'll give them a grant, five or $10,000, to carry out their idea in the community. You know, to date, we've had more than 11,000 employees Right, more than 60,000 volunteer hours in the environmental challenge. Huge impact on waste, on water, and on greenhouse gas reduction in, in the communities in which we operate. And nearly every facility that I visit, there is at least one environmental challenge project that they want to show me the minute I get there. A really remarkable program as far as involvement. And then in the last part, we've been working not only on emission standards with the with regulators and with, with um, our own technology. But we've also been helping work on the, the first greenhouse gas standards. And the greenhouse gas standards and the um, emissions regulations in the US for commercial vehicles are some of the only regulations that I've been associated with anyway, where you've got industry participation, regulator participation, environmental groups participating, and you've got all of them to reach a consensus on some standards. I'm not saying everybody was happy about everything, but all those constituents came together to form those regulations, which are some of the most challenging regulations the industry has ever seen. So it's, the emissions regulations that were for 2010 were more than a 90% reduction in criteria emissions from commercial vehicles. So the ones that we sell today look nothing like the ones we sold 10 years ago as a result of this 10 years of emissions regulations built and finalized in 2010. So a lot <coughs> happened during this time, and we played a pretty significant role in it. Let's go to the next one. So I mentioned to you that today was about setting the bar higher. So, so even though we've been doing all these things, you know, our view at our company is we always should be trying to say, what could we do next to make it better? And if this is going to be part of our business strategy, we need to be pushing this harder. So what we wanted to work on was how to set to keep on doing all the good stuff we're doing, but be more comprehensive. Say, how do we think more broadly about what environmental sustainability is for us? So that meant look across our whole supply chain, beginning to end, and the whole life cycle of our products, beginning to end, and say, what are all the things where we have an environmental footprint, and how can we make progress on reducing them? All right, so that's how we wanted to think about it. And so for us, that meant not only the whole product life cycle, but look at water, look at waste, look at energy, and look at greenhouse gases. And as you'd guess, the ideas for these things didn't only come from me or from my leadership team. You know, we, we have employees all over the company who care a lot about their environment. Right? And, and when they see us not acting the way we, our, our values say we should, they have a comment about that. So we just l listen to them, we see the, all those terrific projects, and we say, hey, we, we could do better here. Let's set a more comprehensive set of goals, and that's what we're setting out to do today. Let's go to the next one. So three basic areas we're going to talk about products. And it turns out for us, when you do the analysis of our footprint, that products have the most impact on greenhouse gases. So if we're just thinking about the greenhouse gas category, more than 90% of Cummins' footprint in greenhouse gases is in the products that we sell. They're fabulous products, by the way, leading in technology. But still, you know, they, they burn fuel. Right? And since there's a lot of them, they burn a lot of fuel. So the, the way that we can impact greenhouse gases the most is focused on fuel efficiency of our products, both the new designs, how do we make the new designs more efficient, and the ones that are out there in use, how can we help customers use those to burn less fuel and do the same amount of work? So that's products. Supply chain. So we've got a gigantic supply chain. Suppliers all over the world, in those 190 countries, we have a lot of suppliers, and we, and we source globally. You know, we have suppliers from all over. And we're moving products all over the world. What could we do to work with those suppliers to reduce their environmental footprint? And just, just in terms of our, our three dimensions, in terms of uh, waste, for example, and water, the biggest impact, more than 80% of the impact of our footprint comes from our supply base. So that's an area that we definitely want to set some targets and focus on. And then operations and facilities. So our operations and facilities aren't the biggest factor in all these, but they have an impact in all three dimensions, greenhouse gas, water, and waste. And of course, since this is an area that we directly control, we want to have really tough standards here, and we want to keep moving them forward. So all three of those are areas of focus. Let me start with products. 
So I said we want to work on design. So, you know, we have some terrific technologies in truck engines that can really change the environmental footprint, especially related to greenhouse gases. You might think to yourself, that's a really old technology. Trucks? Diesel engines? What, I mean, this, what's left in this? What could you possibly do? It turns out that we can improve the fuel efficiency of trucks. We demonstrated on this, um, this uh, uh, super truck, which is a program with the Department of Energy, which, again, Purdue faculty worked on. We demonstrated on this that we can improve fuel economy by 43%. No, by more than 43%, I think. 75%, thank you. 43%, though, improvement in costs for customers. So 75% improvement in fuel economy, which, re which is a 43% cost reduction for our customers in terms of using the truck. So those are big numbers. Think about what other technologies around can be better by 75% and reduce cost by 43%. There's not that many. So this old technology has a lot of life left in it. And the technologies that we're working on are affecting the engine and the vehicle all together. So super truck is just an example of demonstrating technologies. Now why do that? Why do this demonstration vehicle? It's because we, we, in order to produce this kind of results, we need customers, suppliers, the whole industry to come together and say, this is what we want to do. So by demonstrating it, talking about it a lot, getting regulators involved, we can start to drive the industry towards the getting these kind of improvements with this you know, theoretically old technology. So big opportunity for improvement in design. In addition, we're working on in use. So right since 2005, we've begun deploying teams using Six Sigma out to our customers to get more and more fuel savings for our customers. And the numbers are staggering. I mean, many of our, fuel, uh, of our customers, they're running, different, they're running different cycles, they're running different products. And although our engine is terrific that they receive, each application is slightly different. And they may not have the engine optimized. They may not have the right driver behavior. So because we've seen so many of these, we can send these teams out there, get their product optimized, and save them a lot of fuel. And over that time, we have saved hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel. As a matter of fact, $3 billion, $3 billion of savings for our customers in fuel usage since 2005. Just, and, and by the way, this is all reduction in greenhouse gases. This is stuff that just has them burn less fuel. So this is a huge opportunity and, and impact we can have by doing these projects. So we have both of these going on in products. Let's go to the next one. In operations, this is where we decide to set new comprehensive global goals. So we set out one for energy, one for water, and one for waste from our vehicles. In energy, we've been working on energy for some time. We were part of the first climate leaders program from the Department of Energy, and then we set a new standard. And so now what we're saying by 2015, we'll reduce our energy and greenhouse gases by 25 and 27 percent across our entire network by 2015. And when we get to 2015, you can be sure of one thing, we'll be setting a new standard to reduce it more. And the, the interesting thing is, how do we achieve this? We set up teams at each of our facilities who have knowledge about the technologies in that facility, and we have them meet on, by telephone periodically, and they start out meeting once a month, talking about what are all the technologies that they've got, what are things that they're doing in their own facilities. And just by the best practice sharing and benchmarking and, and the, the fact that when you got on the phone next time, you were going to need to show something that the other guy didn't have yet, we got all kinds of savings. We met the, the first climate leader standard, and the net investment from us, we got more savings than we got investment. So return from us was really quick. And so that, that just to show the innovation and the creativity of our employees without a bunch of funding or from us at all. The second round, we put in some seed funding, and now, and now they're having to do more longer-term investments. But still, we're seeing the same kinds of savings. So incredible innovation by our employees. On the water side, reducing direct water use by 33% by 2020. And the second one, which is really interesting, is we're in a lot of communities now, there's a lot, several communities, where there is scarce water already. And you guys know globally this is an issue, right? Water usage is a big issue. So in those communities, what we've committed to is that by 2020, at least half of our facilities will be water neutral. And what that means is they'll reduce their, our own water use, but we'll also go out into the community and make sure that we have projects that increase water availability to offset any water use that we have in our facility. I was recently in India 
And we have a project with this place called Nandal Village right outside of our plant. And what we were able to do is help them clean water that was already available. It's a very water scarce area. Clean water, make it more available, and also make sure they know how to get it out of the river and use it more effectively. And for this village, it's a gigantic improvement in their water availability. Very, very challenged area from a water point of view. So this is stuff that we can do by using capabilities that we have in the company. For example, we do a lot of filtration, so water cl cleaning was a thing that we could help with. Right? So we, we can help with our capabilities and also reduce our water, water usage. Waste is also another area. We've already been doing things in our facilities, but this is the first time we're setting a, a comprehensive a goal. So we're saying we're first going to increase recycling rate from 88 to 95. may seem like it's not a very as big a change as some of the others, but I'm telling you the last seven is really, really hard to do because everything that's easy to recycle that there's already an industry for, I promise you, we are already doing it. So most of the stuff we're going to talk about there, there is no recycling industry to recycle. So we're going to have to invent it. We're going to have to figure out a way to create a recycling industry for the rest. And then zero disposal, which is an interesting idea, we were going to have a zero landfill target, and then one of our facility leaders came and told me, that's not hard enough. Because when you set a zero landfill, it means you can still incinerate things. So, and they said, no, you shouldn't incinerate either. That's bad. So our zero disposal idea is that we have no landfill and no incineration unless you can generate electricity that offsets the incineration you're doing. So it has to be net electricity positive. Uh, so again, it's a tougher standard. And of course, this was set by one of our facilities that achieved this. Uh, so we've had, so they just, you know, they just shoved me and said, that's not hard enough. Uh, so, uh, and so we have two facilities that have achieved this status today. We've got one more that's in the application and we'll have 30 by 2020. So again, you, you, you could say either thing. You could say, these are too hard, these are too easy. What I'd say this about these standards. One is, uh, we don't know how to meet all of them today. So some of these standards, we, like the first one we talked about, we've already got projects ongoing. We're pretty confident we'll be able to get there. Some of these others, there is no recycling industry to do it. We're going to have to figure out. We're going to have to innovate. And, but my sense is that Cummins employees know how to innovate when given a tough target. So setting a target, getting our people involved, Will, will drive the kind of innovation that we need, right? And if we reach the standards ahead of time, we will set harder ones. So there's, there will be no standards that just because we reach them, we're done. That, that just isn't the way we're going to work. Let's go to the next one. So I would say this, that um, we, we know that environmental sustainability can help us win in the business because we've been doing it now from, for 15 years. And by, by pushing ourselves on being the leader in emissions and in fuel efficiency, uh, we've developed technologies that are helping us win and compete in one of the toughest industries in the world globally. So today we win business in China and in India because they think by using Cummins engines, they're going to get technology that helps them compete when they go globally and have to work in other countries where there is environmental legislation already. So even ahead of their own country's environmental le legislation, they want to work with us because they know it's coming to their country and they want to export. Right? So we know it can help us win. And what we want to do is say, use that same innovation and creativity that we've got on our products and with our customers and use it broadly and figure out how to reduce our costs and improve the environment and meet our value about making our community stronger you know, and, and being a positive part of the community. And we think that's kind of how we fulfill our mission. So I wrote here, this is our mission statement making people's lives better by unleashing the power of Cummins. So it's, you can see the, mission state, the vision statement's broader than money. Yeah, it has money in it. You know, we'd like to get and earn money, but we'd like to make people's lives better, impact the communities positively, and we think we can do both with this kind of environmental sustainability set of targets. So with that, um, uh, thanks very much, and I'll turn it over for questions. Are you, who's facilitating? You are. Thank you very much. This on, yeah, no, okay. Uh, that was very inspiring. So uh, I'm Lee Raymond, the director of the Purdue Center for the Environment, one of the people who's very excited about this talk and about the kinds of t plans that you're describing. So I'll be happy to help facilitate questions. I might ask one if I can indulge myself while people are thinking about their own questions, which is just, this is such an inspiring story. And you started it by really saying how when you were first 
kind of faced with some of these regulations, the initial reaction was, oh no, this is something we have to really try to fight. And then there was this kind of moment, it sounds like, where you decided to be a leader in this area rather than kind of sort of um, fighting against these sort of trends. I just wonder if you might speak a little bit more about that process and how you feel that has served Cummins and how you would speak to other institutions and organizations who are facing those same kinds of questions, what you might say to them. Yeah. Um, it was a tough moment in the company's history. Um, you know, we had worked really hard to meet the emissions regulations and in the 90s. They were really hard. I mean, they were really challenging. There re really was not proven technology out there to meet the standards. Um, and, and what's more is our customers were really strongly against it. So they were lobbying very hard not to have them. And we were kind of in the middle of that saying, well, we, we, you know, we don't want our customers to be angry with us. And, and we knew all the price increases in the product were going to go to them. But on the other hand, we wanted to meet the regulations. And so we worked, together, we worked on standards to be able to meet those. And then um, the government, uh, after we met the standards, the government came back and actually sued the industry. We, and, and what they, had, they sued us for was some, some control technologies we, we put in that we thought were OK. We thought they, were, they met the standard. And instead, we got in this place where we were essentially being sued by the government for not complying, and it just didn't fit our values. It didn't feel like the company we wanted to be, which was the one that was saying, well, you guys are not playing by the rules. And, it, it, and so we, we were both angry with the government for what we felt like changed rules. We didn't want to come off as you know, sort of insensitive to our customers, and we really didn't want to be put in this place of saying, you guys are the bad actors. And so what we really had a tough deal. I was in the set of meetings with the leadership group, and we were really feeling wronged and wrong at the same time. And, <laughs> and so what we just decided was we, we had a great, we had technology that we knew was maybe not quite perfect yet, but we knew it was better than what other people had, and we knew we could make it better. And I think what we decided to do is put our resources and focus on the things that we knew we could do and start to take the take the thing in our own hands. And I think that, that change really led us to say, hey, let's take a lead here. And then we started to add to it. So how do we make that turn that technology lead into a business advantage? And I think it probably took us several years to put those pieces all together. But uh, John Wall, who's here, uh, he's over there. He's our chief technology officer. And you know, a big Purdue supporter. I mean, he's probably spends more here, time here than uh, any of us by far. Um, was very involved in putting together the technology architecture that really got us through those standards and really helped set the standards for the future. Um, and you know, John, John was a visionary leader in terms of how we set up the, the technology architecture. So what I would say to other organizations, of course, is you know, I feel a little, a little humble about that, that every situation is different. But I would just say that, that I think you know, for us, if you're going to live by your values, you've got to live by your values in the easy times and the hard times. And it felt to us like this was not the place we wanted to be. Even if other people weren't acting perfectly, we knew where we needed to be, which is out in the lead on this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So are there other questions? And again, if you have a question, raise your hand, and then you'll have to use that little mic in front of you. So it's sort of right here. So just there's a little button on the, um, yep, turn that on, the light will come on, right? Got it. Great, thanks. All right. Um, I was just wondering, what's the big push for natural gas right now? You, you talked a lot about diesel engines, but mm -hmm. natural gas seems to be booming. Yeah, natural gas is a, is, we've been in natural gas engines for about 20 years, and there's a lot, there's, so there's been a demand for natural gas engines for all that time. What's changed recently is there, the demand has started to move into on-highway trucks for the first time. So it, it was always, natural gas was mostly for power generation and some other markets. But now we're seeing it in, in trucks. And the reason we're seeing that is because natural gas costs in the US as a result of, of shale gas fines have dropped a lot. So everybody who burns a lot of fuel now is wondering, could I burn natural gas instead of diesel? And that's primarily because of the cost differences. And, and you know, I would say this, you know, the natural gas fines that Cummins has in the U, in the, oh, sorry, that the US has in these shale gas, they're a huge energy resource for the country. I mean, they are, they are a game changer with regard to energy resources. And a little bit like our challenge we had in the 90s, what I hope we can do with regard to natural gas is we can acknowledge both the environmental challenge, which is really important, 
and the energy and, and, and economic opportunity and realize that they're both challenges that need to be addressed. That we, rather than you know, be religiously one side or the other, say to ourselves, we have this big opportunity to get and we should learn how to get it. And secondly, we gotta deal with the environmental challenges as a result and use technology and our best thinking to make sure that we do it in a safe and sustainable way. Because I think, I think the opportunity is gigantic. And, and this is exactly how I feel like commercial trucking was in the 90s, that you know, trucking is a huge economic benefit to, the, to our country and many others, but we needed to figure out a way to do it more environmentally sustainably. I, I remember when I was a kid, I'd ride my bike and I'd pull up next to a bus and it would blow out this balloon of black smoke and I felt like I was choking to death. And, 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 I, and so I kind of hated buses and trucks when I was a kid. And now if you pull up next to a diesel engine or a truck, you will see, I mean, you could hold a white napkin to it and you will not make it dirty. I mean, the, dif the difference is just phenomenal. It costs a little bit more, but our ec economy can sustain that kind of cost difference. What it can't sustain is, is that kind of either criteria pollutant or not having trucking. And I think the same is true in, in when you think about natural gas. There are there questions? Yes, in the back there. I'm Rich Simmons, I'm a grad student here, and I want to thank you for your leadership. Um, I know it's a very competitive environment that you're in, but I'd like your views on maybe some of the synergies that you have with, with your competitors as we go toward elevating the, the standards and looking at um, the best overall approach for the U.S. industry to improve this environmental aspect. All right. Um, well, uh, another one of our members here, Brian Mormino, um, he's, he's from Cummins. He's been working very hard thinking through who, who are the stakeholder groups in all these areas that we work in, especially in the product side, but you know, broadly speaking in climate change and other areas. Who are the stakeholders? Who are all the people who have a role in it? And that's the competitors or, of course, one, customers, environmental groups, regulators, uh, industry associations, et cetera. And he's got a little chart that he shows all these on, and, and then we try to think about, so how can we move the entire stakeholder group forward so people all see some element of a win in there? By the way, in every problem you can't, everyone won't always see a win. But it's, it's interestingly how often you can find that if you can figure out a way to get most, if not all, the people with some win, how you can move things along in a controversial area where without thinking about that, you just can't. So we think all the time, frankly, about how do we move competitors and others forward in, in spaces that require either some kind of consensus or some kind of uh, regulation to move them forward. So in, in, you know, in the regulatory space especially, getting a practical, uh, enforceable regulation is a gigantic challenge. So just having a regulation isn't necessarily going to help you that much. It might actually take you backwards. But a practical one, one where there's enough lead time, where industry participants can react, where it's techno technically feasible but challenging, where there's one regulator regulated, not seven, who are overlapping, where all the parties understand what the rules are and therefore don't spend all their money suing instead of doing it. All, those things really matter. It turns out that in a lot of regulatory spaces, those things aren't in place, and what you get is a lot of lawsuits and other things and not very much, you know, a lot, a lot of heat and not much light. And so, and I will say that in, in our space, at least in the commercial trucking space, I think in part due to folks like Brian and John and others who have worked really hard to keep that practical element to it, the science-based element to it, and also think about stakeholder groups, we've been pretty fortunate to get most of the stuff uh, working well. So enforcement and working on the practical elements is something you need competitors in the game to make sure that you can get that right. Because if one just, people just opt out um, or decide they're gonna undershoot it by, under, kill it by putting in impractical things, that, that really ruins the whole progress. So that, that's a big area for us. And you'd be surprised at how much time we spend as leaders working on the practical parts of regulation to make sure that they actually work and not, don't just, they're not just a piece of paper. So we probably have time for a couple more questions. Yes, all the way on the side here. Yep. If you could use a mic, that would be great, right? Just press that button. That would be very helpful. Thanks. Hi there. My name is Kaya. I'm the president of the Purdue Energy Forum. 
Great. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think I heard in your, in your speech that over the last 10 years you've accomplished a 90% reduction in diesel engine emissions and that the engines you sold 10 years ago look nothing like what the engines you sell today. So uh, my question to you is, is there an effort to bring back in those, those engines? And you mentioned um, salvage technology, remanufacturing. What, are, what is your main push to bring some of those inefficient engines back in and put them back out on the market? Thank you. Great. Thanks for that. The, I would say um, dealing with old engines is a part of the industry regulation guy that hasn't been very good. It really, I, mean, I, I think, in, at least in the U.S., I think in, in the U.S., getting old things back, like cars and trucks, has is, is not been as strong a regulatory area as getting new ones to be good. And I think the, the EPA has pretty good models about what replacement rates are and what, how that helps over time and how that's going to help greenhouse gas and emissions. But I would say that if, if, if I was going to give any critique, I would say regulations to make things, you know, take older things off the road better would have been an area where we would have liked to see more. Um, so then is there a possible partnership with regulation agencies? That, yes, we have tried that. There are a couple things we have done. Is we, we, there are programs, uh, like DIRA is an example, where there's retrofit programs. So we've, there has been some money set aside. We were very active in regulations on trying to get some for retrofitting. That's a good one. And then another, another area is this in-use effort I talked to you about, where we're going out to customers with products in use and saying, do you have settings right, controls right, and other things to make sure that you're getting the best fuel efficiency in, in the environment that you're running. And you'd be surprised. We, some of our programs, we found 10% fuel economy improvements for, for very advanced trucking firms, trucking firms that are quite large. We got 10% improvements in their trucks just from programs we ran with Six Sigma, which is remarkable when you think about it since it saves them a lot of money, uh, and yet they just weren't getting the settings right. So th those are the things I think we're doing most. On the remanufacturing side, we're also getting products back, and when we get them back, try to take them up a, a standard so that they, they also get better emissions. Out of the company to send them back to you? Uh, remanufacturing, the way remanufacturing works is that we Whenever you um, uh, uh, want to buy a replacement part, you can either buy a new part or you can buy a remanufactured part. If you want to buy a remanufactured part, you have to give us our, your old one. That's the way it works. And I don't want to interrupt, but I want to maybe allow for one more question. But you're going to interrupt. One. Uh, so yeah, over here, I saw you first. <laughs> Hello, thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, I have a different genre of question. Uh, a lot of us here, engineers, interested in leadership positions. Uh, first of all, what, what book would you recommend for us to read? Mm. Uh, and then second question, what is your personal favorite book? Uh, what book would I read? Okay, so with regard to leadership, here's what I would say. I have not read any leadership book um, that I think helps you figure out how to be a good leader. Here, here's what I would say, though. I'll give you a book, good book in in a second, but I would say that um, from a leadership point of view, the single best thing that ever happened to me was working for a good boss. It sounds kind of maybe too practical or whatever, but the fact is that leadership, like anything else, is a practice that requires you to learn some things, and that you know, good bosses are the, mo the easiest way to figure it out. So bosses that will challenge you, bosses that will push you on things that you're not as good at. So I would just say to you, when you think about your job, think a little bit less about the job title, a little bit less about the exact pay and how it's perceived by everybody else, a little bit less about whether the product they make is one that you personally want to buy, and a little bit more about the quality of the boss. Do I think the culture of the company is one that's going to help me learn and reach my objectives? And do I think the boss is really actually cares about me succeeding and is willing to give time into me advancing and succeeding at whatever level I am? I think if you think about it this way, you'll get yourself on a leadership progression. And, and the only thing I'd add to that, which I didn't really learn until my mid-40s, was that knowing yourself is the single most important aspect of being a good leader. I spent a lot of time knowing about other things and other people, and not so much about knowing myself. And I think that kind of capped my leadership potential until I kind of figured out like what I'm not so good at and what I maybe need to pay a little more attention to. Uh, that was a really good way for me to get better, uh, probably like any other, other sport or activity. 
So that, that's what I'd say about that. Um, what would I say is a good book? Uh, <laughs> so many good books. Um, I'm trying to think of the one. Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt is the name of the author, H-A-I-D-T. And I, and I th what's the name of the book? It's, uh, uh, but it's the, oh, the mind, the, the, the righteous mind, the righteous mind. And the righteous mind, the reason I love the righteous mind is it really talks about moral frameworks and how sometimes when we sit and argue about things, we're starting from a different moral framework and we're trying to convince people to do it our way and they're just never going to agree. And of course, I see this every, in every political argument, everything I see. People start with a moral framework and you can give them all the rational arguments you want and they're never going to change. And this, this book really talks about how to think about appreciating where people start and how they think about things and maybe find more areas to build bridges, which you can tell from my talk is a lot about how I think really important things get done. Yeah. So I've been told we have time for one more question. So I think you had your hand up there, right? So go ahead, yeah. If you could try to use the mic, that would be great. Sorry, just because we are taping this. I know it's inconvenient, but. OK, um, my name is uh, Yuan Gao. Um, I'm a master's student, and I came from China. Uh -huh. So I know that uh, Cummings has a lot of um, operations um, in China, like you have a successful partnership with uh, Dongfeng Trucks. We do. Um, and we also know that China has uh, some kind of, um, uh, for example, the air um, pollution concern. So uh, in terms of in, in incorporating your values into uh, your overseas operations, especially like joint ventures, um, what, do you, uh, what do you think are the opportunities and like challenges? Thank That's you. a great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, so what, you know, one of the things that, that it's clear is that Cummins has technology that can impact the air environment in, in every country in the world. And frankly, it's part of our business goals and part of our values to make environment, not the environment in the US better, the environment in the world better. And so we are bringing our technologies over <coughs> to every, in every country that we operate. And frankly, the reason that those companies like Dongfeng, like uh, Photon are partnering with us in the first place is because they think we have technologies that are relevant to their future competition. They expect regulatory in frameworks in China and outside and they want to be able to compete in them. That's why they work with us. Because you know, if they just wanted the cheapest engine uh, in for, that would work in current regulations, many of them would not be sourcing from us now, it turns out. I mean, uh, to be honest, Dongfeng is a little bit more forward looking, but some of the other customers would not be using us. So they're thinking about the future just like other companies are. And what we're, in addition to trying to bring our technologies there, here's the other things we're doing. We're working hard on reducing the cost of them. Because as you'd guess, for a lot of economies, the, 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 the challenge of balancing, improving the environment with what's the cost to the economy is a big consideration, just as it was to the US when we put in the emissions regulations back in the 90s. So in China, they're thinking a lot about that. So we are working really hard at reducing cost. I'll give you a figure just to give you a sense. When we met Euro 4 emissions the first time, which was a, eh, would have been about 2002 or 1998 in the US, we can now produce an engine that meets those same standards for 30 to 35% less than we could the first time we did it. Why? Because technology has moved on. We're better at it. First time, it's hard to do. And you use technologies that are, well, we get to get there, but they're not the cheapest ones and we figured out ways to make it cheaper. So now we can do that, and we can bring that into China now to say we could do that 35% cheaper. Second thing we're doing is we're actually working with the government. So we're pushing the government. We, we introduced, we brought over people from the EPA to meet with people from MEP, which is the Environment Agency in China, to say, hey, let's talk about the form of regulations. How could you implement them? What would they do? And we did that on greenhouse gases as well. So we're trying to push regulations and legislation and again, each country, we have more or less effect, as you'd guess. You know, sometimes they listen a lot to us. Sometimes they listen very little. Uh, it just depends. But I think we're a positive force in all of them on regulation. And then we're also saying, here's technology available, and we're partnering with people. Another, another concern in China is they don't want a foreign company coming over and saying, here's the technology. You should change the legislation this, and we'll sell all of it. We partner with Chinese companies. So they know that it's not just about you know, us earning all the money. We're partnering with, we're participating with the industry, we're sharing technology with the industry, and I think that helps move the needle too. So we're pushing on that. I will say in China, it's a, air emissions is a big problem. They, the, the government needs to move faster. They know it. Uh, they're trying to figure out how to do it, uh, but uh, they're moving 
slower than the population wants. And uh, we, we, it really needs to move faster than it is, frankly. Thanks for that. Well, can, I think we've run out of time. Is that right? We have. Can I just say a few thank yous? Of course. I want to thank uh, Suresh Garamella, Dr. Suresh Garamella. He helped us arrange this. He's not only been helping on that, by the way. He's helped on a lot of things related to the Purdue relationship, which I'm very grateful. Thank you, sir. I appreciate <coughs> it. Um, I want to thank all of you for showing up. None of you were eating lunch or none of you had your feet up, which is what I remember doing when I was in school. So thank you very much for that. It's very respectful. I appreciate it. I want to thank all the Cummins team that are here. Uh, there are several professors here, I can see them in the audience, who have done a lot of terrific work for Cummins that has advanced the ball um, in our technology, key technology areas for many, many years, and we're very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Um, and so uh, it was a great session. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah,